Good morning. I'm Carolyn Parker. I'm president of the American Ethical Union. I want to welcome you to the American Ethical Union All Society platform. Before we begin, let us take a moment to acknowledge as we gather in this virtual space that we are also connected to the land from which we join this space. As the Native Land Digital tells us, land is something sacred to all of us. Whether we consciously appreciate it or not, it is the space upon which we play, live, eat, find love, and experience life. Let us acknowledge the Native Americans on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make, these, make their home on these lands today. I also want to acknowledge that many of our presenters and audience members today are joining us from the traditional territories of the following tribal nations. Miyamia, Ramapo Manse Lenape Nation, Lenape Hoking, Nakoshtonk, and Tonkawa Tribe of Oklahoma. Today's platform will focus on the work that the organization, Our Children's Trust, is doing to protect the lands on which we gather and live, not just for us who live on these lands, but for those who will follow us, our children, the children of this earth. Today, we will hear about that work and learn how we can take part both directly and indirectly. That we would do so is well framed within the mission of the American Ethical Union. The AEU is a federation of ethical, cultural, and ethical humanist societies. This federation supports and serves the ethical culture movement founded in New York City in 1876 under the leadership of Felix Adler. Nearly 147 years later, the movement continues to change, to seek the highest with new understanding, and to serve its mission, which is to create, nurture, and inspire ethical humanist communities in order to foster a world that is democratic, compassionate, just, and sustainable. As a community, we commit ourselves to nurturing the unique worth of every person, to building relationships that bring out the best in others and ourselves, and to enhancing the human capacity to create a better world. Serving our mission requires many hands and many hearts. Our many hands and many hearts may take different approaches to fostering that better world, but our willingness to seek to understand those differences while we appreciate the efforts of others is part of what sustains our devotion to deed before creed. The All Society program came about as a means to bring us together as a national community during the early days of a global pandemic when meeting in person was to put ourselves and our loved ones in danger. What we discovered and the reason we continue to meet virtually whenever the ca calendar provides us with a fifth Sunday is that, our, that this gathering provides our many hands and our many hearts a chance to come together, to hear the same words through our different perspectives and share a moment to seek common definitions and practices. For today, we come together in thought, in practice, in a shared spirit of concern for the world we want to foster for our children, all our children. We'll approach our mission in several ways in today's All Society platform. First, we're going to hear from our Children's Trust, especially about their work in the courts that empowers youth to use their voice to support their own future. We will also learn of specific actions that we can take in our local societies to join the work directly with volunteer support. Second, we will now and from time to time, provide a reminder link in the chat screen that will take you to the AEU website for a chance to support this work with a shared donation. Today's platform will split the plate equally between the AEU and our Children's Trust. 
Third, at the end of today's platform and discussion period, we'll open breakout rooms for further discussion and planning for ways to support our children and their future on this planet. Please stay after the platform and join those discussions if you have the time. Now to guide us through this approach, I welcome today's moderator, Kurt Collier. Kurt is clergy leader for the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County and the Ethical Culture Society of Silicon Valley. Just as importantly for today's gathering, Kurt has a long history of working with the environment and youth as National Youth Programs Director for Groundworks USA. Kurt. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that great introduction, Carolyn. You know, central to our way of life, our philosophy, our religion, whatever you decide to call it, is to continue to look at the greater culture and to ask the question, is it eliciting the best from us or is it eliciting the worst? By examining the broader culture, we can then engage in a variety of programs, practices, and projects in order to continue to shape the broader culture so that it becomes a place for which all life can thrive, including uh, non-human forms of being. Part of that, of course, is to continue to educate the next generation and our young adults to ensure that they are preparing themselves for this work as well. This generally takes three forms, uh, advocacy in which we tell the importance of our youth that you must actively engage. So we don't just have an ethics of convenience, it's an ethics of action. We live our ethics and part of that is to put your body into that through advocacy. The second part of that of course is to do education and to make sure that we continue to uh, understand better the world around us, to think clearly about things, to use our capacity to reason and also to use our emotional intelligence to think about how best we can respond to the issues. There you can see the youth from Bergen County's Great New Jersey Science Show, which is a program we have to raise STEM awareness. And finally, we are a, a type of people who engage our youth in direct action to make sure that they understand that ethics is not something that you simply believe, but ethics is something that you do. And so you see a picture here of our ethical action team from the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County that has been learning how to put tools in hands and to engage in environmental projects and restorations to prepare them for the next generation. Before we move forward, and I'd like to celebrate uh, the New York Society for Ethical Culture that is now the second of our societies that has a climate core. So congratulations to NYSEC. Before we move forward, I'd like to introduce a video by G.A. Bastida, who asks all of us to imagine a future which we can collectively achieve. Anything we ever achieved started with someone imagining it first. So if we can't imagine a way out of the climate crisis, it just can't happen. We know that the crisis is getting worse every single day, and many of us are losing hope for our future. But despair is not an option. We must rise up and meet the greatest challenge of our lives with stubborn optimism. And imagining is the first step. So, are you ready to imagine? In this critical decade, the biggest tree planting campaign in history is sucking billions of tons of carbon out of the air. And forests and indigenous lands, they're protected. This is what your city looks like. It's green, I mean everywhere. Streets are pedestrian and kid-friendly. Food growing on rooftops, in car parks, which by the way, we don't need anymore because we don't own cars anymore. And here's something, birds. Can you imagine your city as a sanctuary for nature and wildlife? There are solar panels on every rooftop across the globe. Clean, interconnected energy lights every home, every clinic, every school. We no longer choke on the toxic fumes of fossil fuels. It's not hard to imagine. This technology already exists. And what about the millions of new jobs created? Are you picturing it? Really picturing it? Roads? They're green too. Traffic's cut right down. 
public transport everywhere is electric, dependable, and free. Can you smell the air? Clean. Farming, all regenerative, which means healthy soil and better food. And we don't eat much meat. Can you imagine what we could do with the third of the world's cropland currently used to grow animal feed? Here's something to imagine. Fields of seaweed, miles long, grown in oceans that cross the planet. They draw down billions of tons of carbon, restore sea life, and guess what? They're a limitless source of protein-rich food. And we can do so much more. Rewild our land, protect our cities from rising sea levels, restore coral reefs. These things we're imagining, they're all possible now, just with technology that's available today. We are the last generation that can prevent catastrophic runaway climate change. We cannot give up. Anything we ever achieved started with someone imagining it first. This is the decade to make this imagined future happen. Share this video and help those around you have the courage to imagine it too. Wonderful, thank you for that. And uh, you may have noticed that we have shut off the chat. We will be allowing for questions later on, but that won't come until we turn on the chat portion during our Q&A uh, portion of today's platform. I'd like to introduce Julia Olson. Very happy to have her here with us, who is the lead attorney. She has been identified as one of the five environmental game changers alongside iconic biologist Rachel Carson in Franklin Curry's 2021 book, The Constitutional Question to Save the Planet. Julia graduated from the University of California, Hastings College of the Law with a doctorate in jurisprudence in 1997. For the first part of her 25 year career, Julia represented grassroots conservation groups working to protect air, water, forests, wildlife, and human health. After becoming a mother, and realizing the greatest threat to her children and children everywhere was climate change, she focused her work on representing young people and elevating their voices on the issues that will most determine the quality of their lives and the well being for all future generations. Julia founded Our Children's Trust in 2010. Since then, she and Our Children's Trust have received numerous awards for environmental activism and welcome, Julia. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. It's wonderful to be here. And I wanna start by thanking the American Ethical Union and all of the societies for inviting me and hosting this and for all of the amazing work you do to make the world a better place. And thank you so much to Carolyn for your words this morning. It feels kind of like going to synagogue or church on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, and thank you to Kurt and of course, Monica and Jake and everybody who helped to make this possible. I am going to start with a slideshow where you are going to hear not just from me today, but from some of the amazing young people I have the privilege of representing. So let's get this going. All right. Everyone can see that okay? Wonderful. Right, let's make sure I can move it. Hmm. There we go. Oh, it went too far. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. All right. So these beautiful faces are plaintiffs in our cases all around the country. And I'm going to tell you a few of their stories today, and you'll get to hear from a few of them as well. And before I do that, I just want to introduce a little bit more about our Children's Trust for those who are new to us. We are the only law firm in the world that exclusively represents young people in, to protect their rights in the climate crisis. And we do that in three ways. So. Our goal is to elevate the voices of young people so they can tell their stories and how they're being affected by climate crisis and to protect the rights of future generations. 
We do that by really paying attention to scientists and looking for science-based remedies to the crisis that can be enforced against governments in systemic ways. And when we bring cases to court on behalf of youth, we're using human rights law. So sometimes that's found, found in constitutions and sometimes it's found in other uh, legal theories and documents. And the reason I founded Our Children's Trust back in 2010 is I think really well stated by Mary Robinson. Climate change truly is the greatest threat to human rights, um, not just for this generation of young people, but for all generations to come. And as I'm sure you all know, it's a very time sensitive issue that only the generation to today and maybe the next generation will really have the capacity to address. In all of our cases, we're bringing claims about children and youth's rights to life, to liberty, to the personal security that they hold, including their bodily autonomy, so the safety of, of their person, their equal protection of the law, so their right not to be discriminated against, and then their right to have access to the public trust resources that every generation before them has had. So air and water and oceans and stable shorelines that have allowed human civilization to evolve. And one thing as I talk about our cases with you today, I'd like you to hold also that these are not adult cases, these are truly children's cases. And so there's a lot of work the law needs to do to center children and not just have an adult lens. This is um, the group of plaintiffs that people may be most familiar with. These are the Juliana plaintiffs in our case against the U.S. government. And this photo was taken last summer. We were on a camping trip. We brought them all out to Oregon so they could be together uh, on this journey as they wait for a next really important decision in their case. But these youth have been at this for eight years. So eight years in this litigation, and not one of them has been inclined to leave or drop out or not participate, which is really remarkable to me and shows the kind of um, resilience and vision that, that Gia was talking about in that video, in that video that was shown. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Juliana case because we have other really exciting cases to talk about today, but I do want to just give a quick update that the next move in the Juliana case is we will get a decision from Judge Ann Aiken, who is our trial judge here in the federal court in Oregon. And when she issues that decision, we expect to be back on track for trial against the U.S. government. And we'll hope that uh, the Biden administration does not try to stop that from happening. So there will be more to do when that moment lands. So before I talk about um, two of our cases, our Montana case and our Hawaii case, I wanna just share this message. Um, it's a really important one. And this was written by Judge Josephine Staten, who wrote a dissenting opinion in our Juliana case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And so we had a, we had a setback of a, a loss of two to one. And in her dissent, she quoted the Supreme Court in saying that fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections and they are beyond the reach of majorities and officials. And it's something, you know, if there are young people in the audience today and even for adults, it's important to remember that voting is really important because it, it helps us determine who's going to set policies. But our politicians don't get to set fundamental rights and they don't get to deny children of fundamental rights. And that's why the courts are so very important because they are the true guardians of the constitution and the enforcement and protection of those rights that are sacred to everybody. And that's Levi, by the way. He, he now is getting a deeper voice and growing up and becoming a young man, it's re remarkable. So we're going to dive into this case first. This is the Held versus State of Montana case. These are our amazing 16 youth plaintiffs 
Um, some of these photos are older. They've grown as well in the past three years that this case has been going. But I just want to pause to say that this is going to be the first children's constitutional climate trial in US history happening. Uh, it will begin on June 12th in Helena, Montana. And this is our judge, Kathy Seeley. She sits in Helena. And a couple of years ago, she wrote a really important decision and that has already gone up to the Montana Supreme Court and, and back down. And she said that similar to the Juliana plaintiffs, the Held versus Montana plaintiffs have established enough um, factual basis to show that the state of Montana is responsible for contributing to and causing climate change because of the amount of fossil fuel pollution it's responsible for. And as you probably know, Montana is one of our largest um, coal, oil, and gas producing states in the nation. <clears throat> the reason why trial matters so much in these kinds of cases, and um, you know, really big constitutional cases need trials. And the reason for that is until judges hear all of the evidence, they hear from the plaintiffs about how they're being harmed by their government, until they hear from experts about, in, the, in our cases, what the science says, what's really happening on the ground and what the solutions to the problem are, they can't render good, strong constitutional decisions. And I show you this picture because these were some of the plaintiffs in Brown versus Board of Education. And they got a trial. And they got a trial even though we had a constitutional um, decision by the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson that said that segregation was constitutional. And so 50 years later, they were challenging that constitutional ruling by the US Supreme Court. And they got to go to trial, even though the law was against them, they got to present their evidence. And that evidence looked like parents testifying about the harm to their children. It looked like experts um, in the fields of social psychology talking about how these young people were harmed by that kind of discrimination and segregation. And it was really that body of evidence that was prepared at the trial level that sustained um, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education to re reverse that 50 year ruling that segregation was constitutional. So trial is critical in these cases. So we will be heading to Helena. Um, there it is on the map for people who don't know where it is. That's a picture of the court and the inside of the courtroom we'll be in. Um, this trial will be live streamed over Zoom. So we'll have more details to come about that, but everything that happens in that courtroom, you'll be able to tune into, um, hearing the plaintiffs testify and the experts for the plaintiffs and the state testify. And um, so we hope we'll see you there. I'm gonna just share with you a few highlights that you'll see in the trial if you tune into it. One of our witnesses who you'll see is May Nan Ellingson. She was in her 20s back in 1972 during the Montana Constitutional Convention, where the state of Montana amended its constitution to create greater protections explicitly for its people. And one of the things that they did was they codified, they wrote into their constitution, the right to a clean and healthful environment. And they said that the state has to provide for adequate remedies for the protection of the environmental life support system from degradation. Uh, New York recently adopted a constitutional amendment like this, and many states around the country have this. And so May Nan is going to tell that story of being a young person 50 years ago and fighting to really protect the natural resources of Montana. And then the trial will have witnesses, experts like Ann Hedges, who really knows what Montana has been doing to promote and, and facilitate and allow all of the fossil fuel extraction in the state. And she will bring forward evidence like this. So in 1968, 
the Montana Department of Public Health said that because of the excess combustion or burning of fossil fuels, they knew that the atmosphere would contain twice as much carbon dioxide than at present, and that it would cause you know, severe water problems for the state. So as early as the 60s, the state of Montana knew that if, if they continued to exploit the fossil fuels of the state, that it would lead to climate change and it would be bad. Um, nonetheless, over the last many, many decades, that's precisely what the government of Montana has done. And it's coal, it's all of the pipelines that are sending fuels um, to other states through the oil and gas extraction. Um, and then they burn a lot in, in their state as well in power plants. And then at trial, we'll hear from people like Dr. Mark Jacobson, who has really developed pathways for every state in the nation and every nation on earth to transition off of fossil fuels for their energy supply. And he'll bring in the story of this is feasible. It's already been envisioned. In fact, it's already been mapped out by experts. This is Dr. Kathy Whitlock. She's uh, one of the foremost climate scientists in Montana on how climate change is affecting Montana. And so we'll hear from her about how the forests are changing, what's happening with fires and what's happening with the water supply. And she'll explain what, this is uh, Lander and Badge, two of our plaintiffs, and she'll talk about how um, the wildlife is being affected by climate change. And this is a family that really relies on hunting as part of their food source and how things are changing for these boys. This is Sariel, she's indigenous, and you'll hear from her about how her cultural practices have been shifting. And you'll hear from an expert um, from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, uh, Michael Durglo who will talk about how indigenous communities are being harmed by climate crisis. And now you're going to hear directly from some of these amazing plaintiffs who share a bit of their stories about how they're being affected and why they're in this case. Yeah, so I'm concerned about climate change because it has a lot of broad implications worldwide and affects a lot of people. Um, it also ties into other issues like inequality and um, also natural uh, natural disasters. And um, but it's also personally not this abstract idea. It's also happening in Montana, and it affects my family with our ranch and our motels. Um, just for example, this last summer with all the wildfires um, that affected our ranch, we had um, our it was we had lots of fires close to our ranch and on, um, on neighbors and um, also with the drought, it affected hay production and a lot of people had to sell their cows in my community because um, there just wasn't available hay. And, um, and there's a lot of smoke in the air and you know just air quality warnings um, and um, heat warnings all the time on my phone. And uh, we also had an event where uh, lame deer in Ashland about 40 miles from Broadus were evacuated because of a coal seam fire and um, and the highways were closed and so that affected those communities um, and also my community because the highways were cut off and um, of course electricity and water um, and there's also ash falling down from the sky so these are very real threats um, to us and um, yeah it's just personally, it's uh, really important that we like start acting now and um, and try to uh, resolve some of these issues. Of course. So, um, like Ricky was talking about, the wildfires are, you know, a big thing across Montana as well as the Northwest. And so, in so as a reminder, I live in Missoula, uh, and most summers the the smoke from the wildfires you know whether the ones in montana or california it all just seems to all come straight to missoula and it settles right in the missoula valley uh and so uh, for example i played high school soccer and most of my seasons if not all we 
uh, had to move cancel practices in the summer or move them inside because the air quality was so bad that it was truly harmful to be outside, much less exercising. Um, my uncle also works for the Forest Service, which is a job that's getting more dangerous, more unpredictable as the fires um, get more intense with climate change. Um, uh, on a completely other uh, different impact, I visited Glacier National Park several times this summer, um, as I'm sure several other plaintiffs did as well. Uh, and I, you know, was up there hiking around the glaciers, making a special effort to go there because those glaciers are expected to disappear within my lifetime. And that's just a really concrete example of um, this anxiety about what I will lose and what I will witness and that sort of mental health stress that comes from, you know, living during the climate crisis um, is just kind of always in the back of my mind. I, I think I and a lot of other youth always carry this weight of feeling like everything is up to us um, now to fix and then to survive. Uh, and also a large part of the mental health impact of climate change for me is about children because I want to have children, I want to raise a family, um, but I struggle with whether it's ethical to raise children when best case scenario, they suffer from the same dread and fear that I've grown up with and worst case scenario, they suffer directly from drought and famine, mass migration and border conflicts, extreme weather. <laughs> you can go on and on with all these climate related disasters that they might have to live through. So I don't want to spend my whole life watching people in places get destroyed by climate change. Um, so this case is just such an important step in preventing a lifetime full of that. Um, so I'm Micah and I'm concerned about climate change because nature is very important to me and just being athletic and being outside. Um, and climate change will impact how and when I recreate outside. Um, I'm also concerned about my future and how that will look with all the uncertainty about what climate change will do and if we can fix, solve it. Um, some of the ways I've been impacted by climate change is that I've had wildfires um, very close to my house and I've been unable to go on runs, backpacking trips and floats. Um, I haven't been able to go outside at school. Um, which has negatively negatively impacted my mental and physical health and most of those are due to wildfire smoke and drought sure um i think i'm just going to echo what a couple of the other plaintiffs have stated um i'm concerned about the instability that climate change and global warming um inflict on, you know, the different areas and environments people live in. Um, and personally, climate change has um, affected us in the Flathead and Lake Counties with um, wildfires. And it's especially noticeable in the summers when we have um, excessive periods of smoke and that prohibits people from exercising outdoors and it's just one of the more noticeable things here. Yeah, I agree with what most of the plaintiffs have already said. Um, personally, I work as a ski instructor and I have for the past five years. And even just within that time frame, I've seen my opportunities for work be really affected by um, severe drought and the climate crisis right now. And I like to think about it as, you know, we've inherited all of this from past generations, but even more importantly, it's like we're borrowing it from the future. And so being a part of it now, um, being able to take action through something like a lawsuit and calling out um, the state government in order to do better is really important. Yeah, so I'm concerned well, about climate. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm. There we go. Um, so those are just some of the the short blips of stories that these plaintiffs will be asked to share during trial. 
And for those who have never been to a trial, they will they will take a witness stand, you know, kind of like you see in the movies, and they'll swear to tell the truth. And then first, the attorneys for the plaintiffs, one attorney will ask them questions. And, and we work with them ahead of time to make sure they know what they're going to be asked and they know um, what they want to say in response that is bringing you know, their best truth forward. And, and then the attorney for the state will do a cross-examination and ask them some follow-up questions. And then we will have an opportunity to do what's called redirect and go back and clarify anything that needs clarifying with them. Uh, Judge Seeley could also ask them questions if she has any questions that she didn't think were answered. And so it's a really big process um, to prepare these youth for trial. They've all sat for depositions already. So they've already had the experience of having attorneys for the state of Montana question them. Um, and after, you know, some of these stories are being told, we're also going to bring in experts to affirm that what these youth are experiencing is actually connected to climate crisis. And so Dr. Lori and Robert Byron, uh, Dr. Lori Byron is a pediatrician. She will be testifying about the health effects. Um, so Micah, who you, who you just saw, he was recently diagnosed with asthma. And she'll talk about the increased incidence of asthma in young people who are exposed to chronic wildfire smoke. So it's, you know, the story plays out in trial with hearing from the youth, hearing from the experts, um, and really connecting that evidence together. Uh, Dr. Daniel Fagri, he will be talking about what Grace said about the glaciers melting. And he'll explain that in scientific terms to the court and why that's happening and what the projections are to validate Grace and other plaintiffs' experience with that as well. And really importantly, one key part of all of our cases is the scientific standard that we are arguing is necessary to protect children. And um, some people may be familiar with the Paris Agreement, which sets targets of heating of 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius. And just to remind everyone who, who may not know, the Earth has already heated approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius or 1.2, um, depending upon who you ask. And that's above pre-industrial times. So before we started burning all of this fossil fuel, we've he heated the planet over one degree. It's already too hot and we're already experiencing all of these harms. And so having politicians and government set standards that allows for even more heating is a violation of children's human rights. And what every scientist tells us is that 350 parts per million is really the maximum level of carbon dioxide we should have in the atmosphere. And right now we're at 419 parts per million. And so it's important that we start reducing those levels. And I'm going to show you uh, another video of Nathan Barron, Nathan Baring speaking about this. Um, Nathan is a plaintiff in the Juliana case. So here's Nathan. We're currently sitting at about maybe roughly 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming. Currently in Alaska, there are multiple indigenous communities on the coast, on the Bering Straits region and in the Northwest Arctic region that are in the process of relocating where they've been for more than 10,000 years. These includes communities like Shishmaref, which is costing over $100 million to put a rough price tag on the cost of climate disruption. And I also want to mention that the Yukon River, which is the lifeblood of hundreds of Athabascan communities that rely on salmon runs, is now closed, I believe, for the third year in a row because of absolutely cataclysmically low science, uh, salmon runs. And this is unheard of in hundreds of years. Like the sam it, 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 it went from millions of salmon in a normal year to like 10,000 in the span of a year. And a lot of that was attributed to the warming events that are um, impacting the ability of those salmon to spawn. And so I only, before I speak kind of in the theoretical lens, I just want to offer that when we're talking about these human rights violations and the fact that 1.5 degrees is already not safe, we're sitting at 1.2 degrees and the Arctic has been warming at about three to four times the rate of the rest of the global region. And we're already seeing these impacts on the ground with their associated $100 million plus price tags. And the 
uncalculable loss of indigenous culture and other cultures that have depended on what Silawat Cloutier from the northern region of Canada calls the right to be cold, the right to not be subjected to the, the, the global climate region that characterizes the rest of the world but does not characterize the frozen Arctic region. So I just offer that as a, as a more concrete way to ground us in what's currently already happening. So I think that message from from Nathan, who who comes from um, Alaska, and he he graduated from college recently. He's again, I've known him for eight years, and is really turning into a true climate leader for his home state. And uh, um, what he speaks about is is really important, right? It's like temperatures are changing, and climate effects are happening differently around the world but they're profoundly um, harming vulnerable communities like indigenous communities and children. And so we do represent a lot of, of children who are indigenous or native in our cases because it's so important for courts to hear their stories. And so I'm gonna turn to talk about our Hawaii case next. And one thing that was really exciting and hopeful that happened just about a month ago now is the Supreme Court of Hawaii issued an opinion in not our case, but another case uh, that was a challenge to a bioenergy power plant. And the Supreme Court upheld a decision not to give the fi final permit to this power plant because it was going to increase carbon pollution um, and further exacerbate the climate crisis. And in a concurring opinion, Justice Mike Wilson wrote, limiting atmospheric CO2 levels to below 350 parts per million is essential to preserve coastal cities from rising seas and floods, and otherwise to restore a viable climate system on which the life, liberty, and property of all people depend. He relied on the Juliana decision in his concurrence, he relied on some of the scholarship from uh, attorneys on my staff who have written about this, this legal standard to protect human rights in the face of climate crisis. And it was really sort of a, um, an evolution of what we've been trying to do for the last 13 years and to have it written in a Supreme Court opinion was really, really helpful to this cause and helpful to our Hawaii case. So, uh, oops, there we go. These are a handful of the Navahine versus Hawaii Department of Transportation plaintiffs. We represent 14 amazing youth uh, in this state. And this case is a little bit different than the Montana case. This case is the first case um, that has ever been brought here in, in the US and and the only one of its kind really in the world where plaintiffs are challenging an entire transportation system and policies of government that make the transportation system what it is. And Hawaii is an interesting state because they've been really progressive and aggressive in setting climate policies. They were one of the earliest states to say, we need to reduce emissions um, basically to zero by the year 2045. And the problem is, is the transportation sector is the largest source of Hawaii's emissions and the transportation emissions are increasing in Hawaii. And they have been ever since these laws were established. And the Department of Transportation does not have plans in place to address this problem. And so the projections for the next decade are these these sources of carbon dioxide pollution are going to increase in Hawaii and they won't meet their targets. So we sued the department and the state to get the courts involved in holding the state accountable for the really progressive laws it has set to deal with the climate crisis. And as islands, they are particularly vulnerable. And so I want to share with you one of the plaintiffs, oh, before I do that, um, you're gonna hear from a plaintiff in a moment, but. In another exciting development, so following on the Montana trial that will happen in June, we're also preparing for trial in our Hawaii case, which will start September 26th. Um, it might get moved a bit, but it should start in the fall. 
and we already made it past the state's effort to get the case dismissed and thrown out of court. And the judge wrote in a really powerful opinion that said, no, this case needs to be heard and the constitution of Hawaii protects these young people's rights. And this is an emergency. And the constitution of Hawaii has some similar provisions as Montana. It's a really beautiful constitution that protects rights to public trust resources, to a healthy environment, and to the other rights that we all hold to life and liberty and security. So I'm going to introduce you now to Kaliko, who is one of our Native Hawaiian plaintiffs in this case. Hello, my Kaliko. My name is Kaliko Kalani Cheria. I am 12 years old in the seventh grade, and I'm a plaintiff in this case, and I live on Maui. So I'm really inspired by being involved with this case because like, I don't want other kids in Hawaii or all around the world in the future generations experience what I've experienced. If you don't know, I lost my house in a flood. I know my neighbors, some of their kids were literally fighting for them for their life, standing on top of their roof so they wouldn't get washed away. So. I just... I really want to make sure that, that's, that nobody has to experience that because it's really, really hard. And like, in like Havana and in Kalapa and Riley were saying, like, there's so much kids that are going to be birthed into a world that might not be safe. And it's really important that me as a Kiki now in this generation helps with that and I'm that's why I'm really inspired to be in this case so thank you so just to pause there for a moment um, and for those who don't know in in, in the Hawaiian language keiki is children and the the Hawaiian plaintiffs they really when they speak you know they they bring in these these words and um just the cultural values of the Native Hawaiian community is it's beautiful. Um, and they talk a lot about protecting the keiki. And that's why they are involved in this case. And so like our Montana plaintiffs and our Juliana plaintiffs and our Utah plaintiffs and our Virginia plaintiffs and all of these youth we represent around the country, um, the plaintiffs in the Navahine case also have really personal stories of the ways in which they're being harmed. And it is so vital that judges hear these stories and that these youth are empowered to tell their governments what's happening, right? So we can give them platforms um, in places like this among supporters, and we can give them platforms with media, and we can give them platforms on the streets to march. And we've brought people to Congress to lobby. But it's really important that they can sit on the trial stand in a court of law and have people advocating for their rights and have them be able to tell their stories. And that's what trial is about and why we're fighting so hard to get to trial in these cases and are very excited for this watershed year where that is happening. And so with that, I think I'm right on time. Kurt, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you. That was a very powerful uh, presentation, Julia. Thank you so much. It's really, really wonderful to hear of all the work that you're doing. We are now going to enable the chat to allow people to put some questions into there. Uh, please remember that questions end with a question mark. And so that I will be reading those. We can only have time for about a few questions. We only have 10 minutes here uh, so that we can move on and allow you to also have plenty of time to engage each other in discussion. While the chat is being enabled, I'm going to ask the first question, so then I can read the next questions that go up there. So, Jake, could you enable uh, the chat room, and we'll go from there. So, um, by the way, Julia, you mentioned that you use science-based evidence to advance claims for youth rights, which is fantastic, and 
Uh, are you finding in your legal work that fewer and fewer defendants in these cases are challenging the climate science or are we still where we were back 10 years ago trying to prove the case for climate change? And if they are uh, pushing back, what are you hearing as for their defenses? What does the other side say? That's a great question. In I think what governments tend to do is they tend to say, we're, we're doing everything we can. And, um, and, and then it varies depending upon the politics of the state. So in Montana, they denied almost all of the fundamentals of climate science. Um, their expert is a woman by the name of Dr. Judith Curry. And she is a scientist who who was trained around you know global climate issues. And what she will come into court and testify to is that climate change is really a function of natural variability. And this is not um, a human caused problem that we contribute a little bit, but it's not significant. And that actually the heating of the planet is good for all of us. And so she's definitely on the climate skeptic realm of things. She's one of the um, the go-to people for the, the sort of conservative right um, that tries to perpetuate climate denialism. So Montana is taking a pretty extreme approach. The state of Hawaii is not going to deny climate science and where we expect the disputes will lie is in what the standard um, should be. So really getting at that 350 parts per million standard and then what the timeline is for transitioning systems off of fossil fuels and how to get that done. Great. We have some great questions coming up here. Tatsy wants to know, how did you find these amazing plaintiffs? So our, when we are looking for young people who want to get involved, we, we typically have youth who have either come to us from a particular state or we have connections to some youth in a state who want to get involved and be a plaintiff. Um, so right now we're, we're building a case that's going to be involved, um, things happening in California. And we've had a number of California youth um, contacting us over the years who we're in touch with. But then we also put the word out to partners and folks like you, you know, we say, hey, we're developing a, a new case in this state. And, and if you know anyone who might be interested, let us know. So it's really through word of mouth, um, through people we know and partners and the youth movement um, spreading the word in the way that only they can. And, and then we go through a, a pretty intense um, interview process and it's a plaintiff intake process to make sure that this person has climate injuries that, to bring forward to court and that it's a good fit for them and a good fit for us and that they're really wanting to take this on because it's a big job. When you collect these funds, Hugh uh, Tap Morales wants to know, what are the main categories of costs that the donations go to fund? What do you, how do you use these funds? Yeah, great question. So all of our representation of these youth plaintiffs is entirely pro bono. These families don't pay anything. Um, the youth don't pay anything for this representation. And in order for us to do that, we right now we, our staff is about 30 people. So we're relatively small. We rely heavily on other pro bono attorneys who we partner with to help us with these cases because we have too many. We couldn't do them all without outside help. So we bring in pro bono attorneys all of our experts, every single one of our world-class experts donates their time. So we leverage the funds, the donations that come in to bring in outside help. But even with all of that pro bono assistance of others and a lot of volunteer law clerks, um, litigation is really time intensive and expensive. So for example, our Montana trial, um, just the expenses, you know, it's gonna be over $2 million. Um, uh, bringing everybody together, paying for the court reporters, paying for the buses, paying for the lodging for the youth and feeding them. Um, so a lot of it is our, our staffing and then the, the expenses. And one important expense that I will mention 
that's I think vital to our work, which we started doing about three years ago, is we hired a trauma consultant and she works with our staff on trauma sense, being trauma sensitive in our workplace and working in a really trauma sensitive way with our youth. She does trainings for our staff as well as our youth and is a resource for them. And so for example, she will be on site in Helena, Montana during that week to work with attorneys and our plaintiffs and make sure that they're really well supported through that process and have a resource on the ground um, as they go through this. The process of being in the legal system, which also has layers of trauma, you know, on top of the climate crisis trauma and other trauma people have in, in their life. So that's an important part of our work as well. There are several people who are asking, what are the specific reliefs or remedies that you're asking for in these court cases? The very first and most important thing is for courts to declare that these children and youth have constitutional rights, um, either to life, to a healthy environment, to a life-sustaining climate system, um, and that they declare that governments are violating those rights. They also need to declare what the standard is for protecting the rights that are being violated. And if you think back to Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, that's the first thing that the Supreme Court did was to declare segregation unconstitutional. So if you declare the Hawaii transportation system unconstitutional, if you declare Montana's policies of promoting fossil fuels unconstitutional, then government has to change its practices and it has to figure out how to undo that violation and, and be moving in the correct direction. And just as with segregation, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so same thing with the fossil fuel policies governments promote. Those are going to take time to unwind. And so the other thing that we ask for in cases is for governments to have a plan and for the courts to oversee the process of decarbonization and make sure there are checkpoints along the way and reports back to the court. So you can kind of think of it as, you know, right now, there's no one really holding government accountable. So even governments like Hawaii, who have good rules on the books, they're not implementing them, right? They're not making it happen. So we need courts to come in and be the enforcers. That's what courts do to make sure their eyes on, there's a check on the political branches and they're making sure they're standing there with the children right here. Like, we're gonna make sure you do this for them. And so there are a lot of ways that can happen and courts have a lot of power to issue orders against government to make that happen. But Jackie Sims asked a kind of a related question. What does the law say about the children plaintiffs? Do, do you have to have adults among the plaintiffs or how does that work? Yes, all of the children who are under 18 who we represent have a guardian also named on the case. And typically it's a parent. It can also be a grandparent or a caregiver. And the guardian is there to advise and support and participate in the proceeding. And the guardians in our cases really let the, the youth lead. So, you know, you'll see parents at meetings, but it's really the young people we're speaking to as our clients. They're, they're our primary client. And um, and everyone really respectfully defers to them when they have to make important decisions. So the guardian is really in sort of an advisory consultant role um, in these types of cases. Yeah, David Bland mentioned that we, these are great examples of youth in rural areas. What if, uh, rural areas? What uh, what efforts are being made to kind of include youth from densely? Uh, urban areas, especially with heat island effects and those kinds of things? Yeah, so we, we do have plaintiffs who are living in bigger cities. We, in our federal case, you know, in the, some of these youth have moved around, but we've represented youth from New York City, for example. We have plaintiffs who live in Portland, Oregon, and have um, urban island heat issues. Um, trying to think of another big city. Um, Miami 
Um, so in Florida, we represent youth from big cities. So we, we really have an incredible diversity of youth in terms of geographic location, the types of climate harms being experienced, as well as um, all of the other ways young people are diverse from you know, their identities and their cultures and their backgrounds, socioeconomic classes and so forth. So it's important to us to really represent all of America in our cases um, when we're bringing these stories forward. Yeah, so kind of our last question is when these youth, uh, this comes from Elaine, when these youth give this kind of heart-wrenching uh, testimony, what does the other side say to that? How do they respond to the fact that these are youth who are expressing real anxiety, real fears about their future? You know, it, it depends on the, the attorney or the, the defendant. I think there's a lot of, I think people put walls up and try to compartmentalize the emotion that they may feel if they were really listening with the intention to help. You know, you listen differently when you're listening with the intention of really hearing and helping, as opposed to when you listen from a defensive posture of wanting to just you know, defend the, the status quo. Um, but I'll, I will share that in one of the depositions of one of the youth plaintiffs in the Montana case, um, opposing, one of the opposing counsel had tears, um, you know, running down their face. So, I mean, it can touch people and, and I think it touches the judges who are the most important people to touch. And, and it touches all of you who can, you know, support us and continuing to represent them. Yeah, it certainly has touched a lot of us. Thank you, Julia. Um, we're going to have to close. Unfortunately, we have time at the end for people to stay and engage in ongoing discussion where you can actually ask additional questions and also talk about your local projects. Uh, we want to put up a brief slide of uh, commercial for just a second about the encampment for citizenship. And there uh, is how you can find all of the stuff. No, please do. There's the links to uh, our Children's Trust. You want to say something more about that, Julia? Sorry, uh, maybe I, I jumped ahead too much. Was I supposed to wait on this? For <laughs> go ahead and do it now. This is appropriate. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry to go out of work. How can we take action? Um, so just briefly, um, I'm not following the script apparently, but if there are some quick things you can do, um, of course, you know, donate to the American Ethical Society to share in the gifts for today. Um, you can also sign up to get information from us. The petition on the left of the screen of that slide is a petition to sign to support the Juliana plaintiffs and to speak to Attorney General Garland about not um, doing the extreme measures that the Trump administration took in our case. You can share with your friends, host a film screening of the Youth v. Gov film about the, the Juliana case that's streaming on Netflix. And you can sign walls of support for our youth plaintiffs, um, Montana, Hawaii, Virginia, and our Utah plaintiffs. They all have really big upcoming events. And they love to see the support from around the country and the world for their cases. So I would encourage you um, to check out our website and, and get involved. And then if you know anyone, last thing, we are hiring. We have a lot of internships, clerkships. Um, and we also have some full-time staff positions open. So um, tell people to check us out. Sure. And if you look and, in the chat, you'll see where Rachel has put the links uh, to make donations for our Children's Trust and also where to find additional information. Do you have any more closing words, Julia, before we move on? No, just thank you so much for being here and, and listening and, and learning. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I do want to mention that uh, Founded in 1946 by Algernon Black, the Encampment for Citizenship is ongoing. Uh, there are, that's a great place to learn the principles and techniques of citizenship through lived experience. There are some spaces left for our youth um, and for youth you may know. And I believe there is even a little bit of scholarship money 
And if you want to know about more of that, Rachel also put the link over there in the chat you can see as well. For our closing video, uh, we'd like to show something called Good Planets Are Hard to Find by Steve Forbear. And then we'll talk about how you can join us in the breakout rooms that will follow. But first, let's watch this video together. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. True currents in thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Good planets are what? Hard to find. Good planets are in demand. Clean beaches and sparkling sands and the land masses. Room to spare, that's good, yeah. Jet streams and perfect air. High forests and low wetlands are good planets are in the demand. And the mind don't know. Yeah, the heart can't see. Let the blind man go to his destiny. Yeah, go planets are rare indeed. Rain falling on crops and seed. Big rivers and good topsoil. Fuel sources from cane to oil. Green garden all that we need. Good planets are. Rare indeed. We're so glad that so many of you joined us for today's platform. If you'd like to make a donation to the All Society Platform Fund, you can find the link in the chat. We appreciate your support. These uh, programs, of course, require lots of staffing, lots of effort, and we would like to continue to offer them and provide this wonderful stuff. So please do donate. Individual societies may be having their own copy time after this platform, and please feel free to post links to the chat if you are. Folks are free to join any of those virtual gatherings. If your society is not planning a virtual copy time, we hope you'll remain in the Zoom space to socialize in smaller breakout rooms. Those of you who'd like to stick around and join a breakout room will have a choice of which uh, room to join, you'll see there. The breakout rooms will each have questions to get the conversation flowing. Thank you again for being with us today. Thank you so much to Julia. And uh, now we will enable the breakout rooms and uh, have a great morning, everybody.